What will you do if jihad comes to you? I just wonder if you've thought this through. It's no use to be scared. It's best to be prepared. And that means in thought as well as acts. So David Wood's here to give you the facts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to This Week in Jihad. I got to tell you something. It is now 5 p.m. Pacific time, United States time, 8 p.m. Eastern. And at uh, 448 or 748, I realized, oh, I don't have a poem for tonight's episode. <laughs> That's why this one was so, uh, uh, let's say, more third rate than the others. But what happened was, I got to tell you, the it's still, it's, Gabriel, still, it's, still, it's 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 still better than the Quran, though. So just so you know. Well, that's what. I, yeah, that's actually what I'm. The, the angel Gabriel appeared to me. I began to tremble. I began to break out into a cold sweat, even though it, it it's it's an extraordinarily hot day, and I went into a kind of trance. And when I came to, it turned out I had an extra wife, and this poem. And now your lives and property belong to me. So uh, I think that uh, at this point, really, we understand the origins of Islam. Anyway, that's the traditional story. We'll get yeah, the rest well, of the story in October. Yes. Well, Muslim, Muslims can't argue with that airtight logic. We'll just say that. That's right. It's uh, produce a poem like it. You can't do it. It's It cannot be yeah. done. Yeah, anyway. and we just we just want to clarify. We just got to clarify again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Robert has declared that he got that from the angel Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And the only way anyone can prove him wrong or disagree with him is to make something like it. And to top the cherry on the ice cream sundae is that I will be the judge of the contest. That's right. That's how it and, works. Uh, so send in your submissions, but... It's going to be tough. You, you're going to have to surpass the greatest poetry in the history of the world that has ever been conceived by the mind of man. Anyway, uh, hey, hey, yes. Ro hey, Robert. Oh, just yes, wanted Dave. you to know. Cause, uh, uh, so Muhammad Hijab posted his, uh, uh, his uh, new basically case for why Islam is true and how we can know that Islam is true. And I was legitimately interested in it because, as mm -hmm. you know, their top arguments from the past several decades, they all now acknowledge were based on deception. The, so the, uh, the uh, argument from perfect preservation, the argument from scientific miracles. We said for years, this is all complete nonsense, but now they agree that it's complete nonsense and they don't use those anymore. So you, you can still find people in like comment sections and so on who use them, but the Dawa guys, they've abandoned them and they've acknowledged that these are, they've been completely debunked and they were based on deception. Um, the, uh, well, What's uh, So I was actually really interested. What the heck is Muhammad Hijab possibly going to say in yeah. defense in defense of Islam? And what's interesting is they circled back. He circled back to arguments from like 20, 25 years ago that they abandoned back then because they'd been destroyed. So it's like Dawa is is uh, cyclical. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is this, it's a series of uh, cyclicals. It's, it's just going to be there. They're, they're, he went back to Muhammad's character as an argument. So, oh, the moral really? argument. I used to, yeah, I used wow. to call that the mor the moral argument, and people don't realize that's why we started blasting away with Muhammad and Aisha and all these other things, was because they were using Muhammad's character as an argument for Islam. Um, but go along the lines of what you were just pointing out, he actually he actually went back to the uh, inimitability argument that the Quran is so great, and he says, and this is a falsifiability test that no one has ever been able to meet. So this is the proof. This is he started going. This is ironclad. It's ironclad, and we're like, are you serious? All the arguments that we completely destroyed years ago, and they stopped using. Then they came up with new arguments. Then we destroyed those. Now they know. Now they acknowledge that these arguments have been destroyed. Now they go back to the arguments of the previous generation. It's uh gosh, it's insane, man. That was crazy. Oh yeah, that's wild. He actually said that it's inimitable. Yep. I mean, that's the yep. most ridiculous argument, as you yourself have pointed out on this award-winning program many times. That is the most ridiculous argument imaginable because it's 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 impermeable. There is no objective criterion that on which the judgment is based. The judges are all biased. That's what I was making fun of. I didn't realize That's anybody right. actually took that seriously. 
That's what's point. crazy. I mean, we make fun of it constantly and we constantly point out the absurdity of it because if you leave it to a non-Muslim to say, has this challenge been met? They're going to say, yes, any any five-year-old could could meet that challenge. But the Dawah guys at the end say, no, 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 we've, we've examined this and we are the unbiased, <laughs> we are the unbiased judges of this contest. Uh, the guys who do nothing but lie in defense of our religion, we're the guys who are going to be the unbiased judges of this contest. And it's like, it's just so ridiculously insane. But he was pointing that out. And uh, how could, if Muhammad weren't a prophet, how could he be putting forward this, this challenge that allows him to be refuted? But it never has because of the power of the Quran. It's like, oh my goodness. But they are making it fun. Uh, yeah, I, I, if they're just recycling to old arguments, I think it's funny because it's way easier to expose their arguments now than it was, you know, in 2000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Way although, you easier. know, I kind of miss, uh, do you remember Sura like mm -hmm. And they had all these surahs. Uh, yep. Some of them were very impressive in terms of the Quranic language, Quranic cadences, Quranic rhythm. Uh, and unfortunately it's gone. I hope somebody perhaps can revive that. Uh, well, we it, probably, probably let it, probably let it down because, huh? No one's stupid enough to use this argument anymore. We could just yeah. let our site die. Nope, you underestimate the stupidity, the resilient stupidity of Dawa. Incredible. All right, so you might be wondering, this week in Jihad fans, why there was no this week last week. That was because I was a week ago tonight at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles. Ian H. was there. He says, I was at UCLA last Wednesday waiting for your lecture to begin. Once I got there, I learned it was canceled. Indeed, uh, I was on the scene. I was ready to go. The It's interesting to note there's been a lot of disinformation about this, even from the university. But uh, it was approved by the university. I went to the campus. And then... The, we were told that the room would be locked and we would not be allowed to be there and the event was canceled after all. No reason was given, no explanation, but obviously the uh, UCLA administrators were afraid that the um, pro-Hamas forces would riot. There were a lot of them. What happened was uh, they ultimately let me and some of the people from Young America's Foundation into the room along with the Young America's Foundation chapter, which was about 10 or 15 young people from UCLA, very courageous young people. And so we're in the room and they're marching by uh, right outside the window with their, you know, free, free Palestine and all that. And I made a few videos and chatted with the kids and left. And then the UCLA administrators actually said the event went on as planned. But they succeeded in their objective, which was to make sure that nobody would be allowed into the room who might actually get challenged by ideas that he or she had not previously heard. And this is uh, <clears throat> this is kind of bigger than that one specific example, because, you know, this this sort of thing happens all the time, but it's massively discouraging for people who want to set up events that might challenge some idea. You say, oh. We're gonna we're gonna have this event. We're gonna uh, argue with the university, go back and forth until they finally give us permission. Hey, you're letting I mean you're letting all these Hamas supporters basically control the campus. Can can anyone can can anyone say anything in response? Finally, they'll say, okay, finally you yeah you can have an event to to challenge some of the ideas uh, presented. And then on the day of the event, they make sure no one can actually show up to it. And so it's that particular event. But I mean, think about think about how difficult it becomes to even think about setting up events in the future for mm -hmm. for that group. Right. It's well, like, wait a minute. Idea, you know, yeah. Fascists, yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, we can put all this. All we can put we can put all this energy into it. We can uh, people can uh, arrange their schedules. We can put the word out. Uh, we can uh, we, we can we can have people showing up to fill the place up. Um, but, uh, nope, they'll just shut it down at the last second and then all that time and energy, uh, wasted and it's a message for the future. Uh, yeah, we can kind of do what we want. So it's better just not to even try. It's better not to try because they'll shut you down at the last second after you. So, I mean, it, 
it's actually better if they just say, no, we're only allowing one side of any issue to be presented. So don't even plan it. That would be one thing. It's 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 worse to actually let people go through all the planning stages and then just shut the door in your face when you, you know, right at the right when it's there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure why that happened, David, you know, why they didn't just put the kibosh on it right away, uh, because Yaf is going to sue them. And so it's not like they escaped Good. that. Uh, Good. They prevented the event, which is what they wanted to do clearly from the beginning. You know, another interesting thing about it was uh, they, the, the David Horowitz Freedom Center sent security. The Yaf people had security. There were campus police. And so I was going to go to campus and they said, do not go to the campus. We will meet you at another location. These are the, the security people. And bring you to the campus. So they did that. When we got to the campus, there were all these cops. I felt like Joe Biden, not maybe not quite as scatterbrained, but I cops everywhere. They say, stay in the car, you know, and, and they make sure that everything's clear. And then I got out of the car and they hustle me into all these back passageways and storerooms and places with all these boxes stacked up and stuff. And we're going through all these hallways, cops everywhere. Every now and then I would see a student and I'm surrounded by cops everywhere. And the thing about that was that all this security indicates that they knew that the Hamas mm -hmm. supporters were going to be violent. And of course, you know, I wasn't born yesterday. I know that if I had just shown up on campus, I would certainly have been assaulted at least. And, mm -hmm. uh... What is that? That doesn't seem to tell them anything. They still pander to these people. Yeah, and it's that's the funny thing. Everyone knows, right? I mean, everyone, everyone who has anything to do with air so airport security <clears throat> knows what that's all about. It's all about this religion of peace that we keep saying is incredibly peaceful, but everyone knows that's absolute nonsense. But I mean, again, think about that. It's uh, so your group. Uh, the YAF, they're a group. They want to set something up. Plane tickets are arranged. Security is arranged. Security ain't cheap. Security ain't cheap. Um, and then they just, eh, we'll, we'll close the door at the last second. Yep. It's pretty pretty rough. Pretty I mean, rough. they had to pretty pay all pretty. those cops. You know, they actually could have given all those cops the night off mm -hmm. and not given me the total Secret Service treatment and saved a lot of money. They got it. They had to save you from corn pop. <laughs> That's right. You know, yeah, no, he was, corn pop. He was corn pop. He was a bad dude. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad the I'm glad the YF is suing. And it's uh, at the end of the day, that's the only thing they'll listen to. Yes, that's the only that's the only thing that's the only thing that the universities uh, listen to. It was like back in the day when uh, Pamela Geller was in New York putting those signs up and so on. And they would say, no, 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 until you sued the crap out of them. And they say, OK, yeah, because yeah. we're actually breaking we're actually breaking our own rules and showing bias to one group over another. So, yeah. Uh... And, you know, David, they actually changed the rules in New York and in other cities when we were running our ads about calling attention to jihad and countering cares ads you remember council on american islamic relations had those ads we've made fun of them before yeah. this is my jihad getting to yeah. the gym on time stuff yeah. like that so we actually had quotes like you know jihad means the smashing of skulls and the s spilling of blood that actual jihadis mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. and we put those up and they changed the rules no more political mm -hmm. ads and yeah. that's actually still the rule in most cities because of our ads so they just just so they can avoid having anything critical of jihad violence mm -hmm. yeah and that that happened in multiple places but yeah so it was interesting for a while while the old rule was still in place and once the lawsuits started coming all of a sudden for a brief time there were both sides of the issue there were both yes. sides of the issue because they'd been they'd been having uh, the signs uh uh, showing look this is what Palestine was before the Jews came and it's and there's these maps and it's like anyone who knows the story there was no Palestine what are you talking about that was the Ottoman Empire and then it became the British mandate of Palestine what are you talking about there was no country called Palestine you liars right but if you mm -hmm. responded to it at all or wanted to put something up that just said that ju that just gave a different perspective no yours is blocked but we'll allow this one and then it gets pointed out well no you have to have both and then for a brief time there's both and then they actually say well, 
if it means we have to allow both sides to speak, then we'd rather not let anyone speak at all. And it's like mm-hmm. that kind of tells that kind of tells you something. That kind of tells you something about the entire system. We would rather shut down all speech than allow people to hear both sides of any issue. And that's uh, that's pretty insane. But it's the exact same thing on college campuses right now. Oh yeah, and you know, David, the the billboard thing and bus ads and train ads and things like that, that's all still rigged because the Islamic Circle of North America puts dawa on buses and trains and billboards and it's just religious and that's okay. But if we counter it, then that's not religious, that's political. And so it's not allowed. But you know, there's an interesting thing. When all that was going on, there was another group, this was not our ad. I don't actually even remember who put up this ad, but do you remember the ad? And it said stuff like, he married a six-year-old girl. He, uh, what else? He was a warlord who, who ordered the assassination of his enemies. Yeah. And all these bullet points about Muhammad, but it never said Muhammad. Never, never said Islam. Ne- never said his name. It's just mm-hmm. describing some horrible person. And mm-hmm. the billboards were up, and suddenly Care is saying, this is Islamophobic. And, of course, the obvious answer yeah. was, what are you talking about? Why are you assuming this is about Muhammad. Yeah, yeah you guys are the Islamophobes. Yes. <laughs> we, we we say, look at this horrible, evil person. You go, oh, they're talking about Muhammad. So you guys, uh, you guys know too. You know what? The, you know what? All that reminds me of Robert. All of that reminds me of uh, when people started posting just randomly, without any without any commentary or anything. They would they would just post somewhere, like on Twitter and stuff, or they'd write it somewhere, leave a sign up that says, "Muhammad was right about women." Oh yeah. And it was it was so I mean, that was the most brilliant troll ever, because it's all these people saying, no, Islam is great. And Muhammad is a champion of women's rights. And Muhammad is a great feminist. And he's so great. And Islam, women have it so great when they're when they're Muslims and stuff. They say Islam is right about women. They go, "Ah, how dare you post something like that? What kind of evil person? Like, you know, you all know all you people say religion of peace. Great for this. It's great for that. It's been the golden age of Islam. You all know it's idiotic nonsense. And it's just how do we get you to how do we get you to acknowledge that, you know, it's all idiotic nonsense. Oh, my goodness. Well, David, we could go on with this. uh, The whole show, but there is more jihad. Uh. Actually, you know, speaking of moral equivalence, because they were uh, saying that, you know, you you could run both sides for a brief period, but really they only allow one side. And we've had this massive example of moral equivalence this week with the International Criminal Court calling for or requesting actually the arrest. And I just saw now that Germany actually says, yeah, we'll arrest Netanyahu for you. So that's interesting. The Germans, they, they're good at arresting Jews. They've done it a lot. And so uh, yeah, they they're like going to do it again, apparently. The uh, International Criminal Court, in case anybody doesn't know, has called for the arrest for war crimes of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, Yoav Gallant, the Defense Minister, as well as three Hamas top dogs, uh, Ismail Haniya, uh, Yahya Sinwar, and what was, was it Mashal was the other one? I think so. Anyway, three Hamas. I don't know. Leaders. Two of those. Two of those. Yeah, two of those guys are currently hiding in tunnels. Yes. So, what's wrong with yep. the moral equivalence in that case, David? They're they're being admirably even-handed, aren't they? Well, yeah, they're, and that's all. Uh, that's all well planned, right? So they're, hey, see, we're not we're not just going after we're not just going after uh, Netanyahu. We're going after Hamas too. See, we're being we're being equal here. Uh, we're being unbiased, uh, but you're lumping you're lumping Netanyahu together with uh, with actual terrorists who attacked him and slaughtered and raped and took a bunch of hostages, and then of course he went to get back the hostages and hunt down the people who killed all his people. And they're saying, "See, we're treating them all as equals." Yeah, there's not they're not equals. <laughs> Those guys aren't equals. Even if, even if you don't like anything Israel has done, they're not in the same ballpark with uh, with Hamas. So that's just uh, yeah. Israeli just Prime insane. Minister, uh, former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, I think uh, put it best that it would be like at the end of world toward the end of World War II, issuing arrest warrants for Hitler and Harry Truman, and acting yeah, because they both killed, they both get. They both killed lots of people, Robert, so it's the same thing. There you go. 
What's the diff? It's right there in front of your face. You see? We have to, I just have to, I just have to bring up again with the comment about, uh, with the, with the Germany, Germany. Yes. The Germans. You recall, you recall, it's been pointed out numerous times. Would I want everyone to be, to be aware of this. You remember Hitler moaning and wailing about having Christianity as, as the, the dominant religion and him moaning and wailing and saying, why couldn't we have had, why couldn't we have had Islam, which encourages, which encourages conquering and, and fighting and bloodshed and so on. Uh, see, he, he viewed the Arabs as an inferior race. He viewed his own race as the superior race, but he, he viewed Christianity as a defective religion because it doesn't encourage conquering the world. And he thought, hey, if we combine, if we combine the master race, the smartest and best people with an ideology like Islam that's hell bent on conquering the world, we would actually conquer the world. It would be the perfect mixture. And here we are uh, all these years later and German leaders are making Hitler's greatest dream come true. They're Islamizing They're doing it. Germany. Yeah. You've, um, you, you've, seen, you've seen the articles about German kids now converting to Islam just mm -hmm. to avoid being harassed and bullied by the, non, by, the, by the Muslim students and so on. So now you're actually getting the German, the native German children converting to Islam. Hitler, Hitler would, would be absolutely elated at what's going on and they're making it happen. He would do another one of those jigs, you know, his famous jig at the fall of France. It was actually a tape loop, a primitive 1940 tape loop, but looks like he's dancing a little jig. Anyway, uh, we have here, where is she? Like I could miss her. Here's our friend Lizzo. Lizzo! <laughs> and she's in the news. Wow. <laughs> Get rid of this picture. This is terrible. She's in the news this week because, of course, she has come down heavily, come down with the full weight of her moral authority. On, <laughs> <laughs> she has tipped the scales. After spending so much time bouncing around. Uh, sorry, sorry. That's right. <coughs> In favor of the Palestinians. Uh, she has said that the uh, pro-Hamas demonstrators on campuses have inspired her, pulled her out of her deep, dark depression. She said, what these students have done and are doing is so deeply important. Uh, and uh, she says, wait, of course, wait, what, what, what students, what students, the students that are doing, putting up the encampments and agitating for the Palestinians on uh, ca I, college I'm, campuses. I, I, I'm confused. Right? See, that's what I thought she meant. But what have any of those students done to help actually help one person in Gaza? Can you think of anything? I can't think of anything they've done to help anything. In fact, I think they've constantly been making it worse because they're the ones who keep encouraging the Palestinians to fight a, a battle they cannot possibly win. They encourage it. If the rest of the world, if the rest of the world told the Palestinians, guys, they're way more powerful than you, stop freaking fighting and try to build up your area, then that would be one thing. But they don't. Oh yes, we're with you. We're with you on our college campus where we are totally safe and you're the ones who are going to get bombed. But keep going, keep going after those Jews. And so, as far as I can tell, the college, the college students and the, uh, the, the global protests and so on are the ones who keep the endless cycle of bloodshed going. And I have to say, the people of Gaza are the ones who are on the receiving end of the, the worst of that. Yes, you were correct, sir. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but it, what can you say you, about Lizzo? Hey, I, 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 doth bestride no, I just, the I just narrow world say, like I mean, a colossus. I just I sit there and think, OK, what are these college students thinking, thinking they're doing? Are they dumb? Are they really this stupid to think, oh, we're out here sitting around singing songs and doing dances. Uh, we're making a difference when you're doing nothing except getting attention for a little while. That's it. That's all you're doing and, and patting yourself on the back. But then 
Lizzo, wow, look at these guys. They're making a difference. That proves that there are people who are as stupid as the college protesters. That's that's amazing. It's true. It's true. It, like, in other words, in other words, it actually worked. They actually impressed someone. I thought the entire world was like, who are these idiots? <laughs> but no, you actually have someone going, going, wow, wow, so powerful, man. Look at these kids. Well, the whole world is changing, David. I got a story out of France here. And, uh, you know, we've had so many stories out of France here that are exactly like this story. Okay? I mean, exactly. All you have to do is change the date, change the last name of Muhammad, and change the time, and it's all the same. Because this was a man in the street, a Muslim, holding a knife. What was he screaming, David? I'll go with Allahu Akbar. Once again, yes. So you see, it's like hundreds of other stories, hundreds that we have covered here. It's the same old thing. They have a template, you know, they must at the local mosque that night. Okay, you're the guy, you, you get picked. Maybe they have a roulette wheel like you do or uh, the short straw or something and somebody gets picked to go out on the street with a knife and scream Allahu Akbar, get tasered by the cops. Uh, anyway... The thing about it is, I thought was very interesting, was that there was a French language story. Of course, these stories are not reported at all in the American press or the any kind of English press. And so Le Parisien had the French story. And it's got this very interesting statement from Stéphane Barnier, the mayor of Brou-sur-Chantereine, where it happened. What, sorry, I ain't French. Anyway, uh, he... Is the mayor says there was not too much panic. That's good because the police intervened quickly. But I thought, see, this That's is not, we're we're getting we're getting to another stage of jihad here in France. That now it's taken for granted there are going to be guys out on the street screaming "Allahu Akbar" and waving around knives and threatening people. But if somebody, after a while you get used to it, there wasn't a whole lot of panic. And so it's a victory. They're getting used to the new situation. Yeah, that's why um, sometimes I think people need more Islam rather than less. Because when it's a, uh, it's like the old, I, I don't think I don't think this actually works, but the old story of you toss the frog in some water and slowly turn up the heat then you can slowly boil the frog. But if you turn the heat way up, then it just, it jumps out. Yeah. But it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. It's like they try to slow it down just enough for people to get used to it instead of shocking them. But yeah, the it looks like various nations are getting used to uh, yeah. Islam and getting used, getting used to having their kids bullied and getting used to all the sexual assaults and so on. And that's what part they, of life you know, now. That's the idea that it's easier for the uh, political leaders to deal with people just getting used to it than them having to take hard action to stop it. Well, the, the terrible part is people can get used to it. People can get used to just terrible, terrible environments. And they can get used to a situation where they have to keep their mouths shut as Islam takes over and so on. They just, you can get, they can get used to it. Um, so that's the, that's the awful part. Then the, you've got the, the leaders, got the government officials who are basically saying, uh, yes, our people are going to be oppressed and subjugated and so on, but a uh, small price to pay, small price to pay for mm -hmm. this beautiful thing, where this beautiful dystopia we're building. Our multicultural mosaic, our glorious, mm -hmm. gorgeous mosaic. I remember way back uh, in, the, in the early 90s when Dinkins was mayor, and I thought that I was living in New York, and I thought that the city had bottomed out uh, I didn't. I didn't see that it, what was coming, how it is now. But anyway, uh, and you remember they, a... he said the gorgeous mosaic, the glorious mosaic of the city. And I thought, yeah, it's mm -hmm. if they would if they would take the garbage every few days, it would help. But anyway, yeah, you remember? Uh, I think it was General Petraeus, and it was after one of those uh, 
uh, those attacks where the Afghan, the one of the some of the one of the Afghan soldiers who's supposedly helping the U.S. actually guns a bunch of them down mm -hmm. and so on, uh, and they can't figure out what to do. And like soldiers are coming out saying, "We we could tell, we could tell there's a problem with this guy. We're not allowed to say anything because we get called bigots and so on, and we get in trouble if we say we do not trust this guy." And then uh, I think it was General Petraeus comes out and he goes, uh, yes, we lost a number of lives, but that's a small price to pay for our diversity or some crap like that. Yeah. Like, what the heck? Yeah. What the heck is wrong with you, man? I'm not sure. I think it might have been another general. Might but, have been. Yeah, but it was. Uh, yeah, I remember it, that. I remember that. It was just what's more important is our diversity and stuff. And it's like, that's what you say after a bunch of U.S. soldiers get killed by a guy days. they're not allowed to criticize. Yeah. But uh, not everybody is happy in France. Not everybody is not panicking. Some people are still very upset, but it's on the other side, David. See, here is a statue in a church of Mary, the mother of Jesus, with the baby Jesus. You can see the baby Jesus there. You can see that Mary seems to have lost her head. And if you see at the bottom of the photo, there's her head lying there at the base on the floor of the church. Now, somebody came in to this church. They beheaded the statue and set a fire in the church, St. Therese Church in Poitiers. Apparently, these, these people, whoever did this, has not reconciled to the idea of there being churches, there being statuary, uh, images of, of saints and so on. And so, of course, we don't know, have any idea who did this. And it might just have been some nut, some leftist, some iconoclast, who knows. But could it possibly have been one of the new arrivals in France, David? Uh, well, it would... Uh... It's a similar situation to when there's a terrorist attack. You don't have any news... In theory, it could be all kinds of people. Other, There are all kinds of groups that wage terrorist attacks. But if you're just going with probabilities and background knowledge, you'd have to say follower of the religion of peace because that's where it comes from most frequently. Yes. Uh, it's important to remember that the uh, Quran, of course, very strongly rejects the divinity of Christ and it uh, in Islamic tradition representational art is completely forbidden and not only that but ruins are something that the Quran likes it says this many were the ways of life that have passed away before you travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who rejected truth that's chapter 3 verse 137 and that's a very interesting passage because what Allah is saying there is go through the earth and see the ruin ancient ruins and it's a sign of the divine judgment. And so this is one of the reasons why there are so many jihadis who create ruins. You know, the ISIS people, they uh, destroyed that ancient Roman, uh, the ancient Roman ruins that were in their domains. Um, trying to forget, I'm trying to remember the name of them. I can't remember the name of them. Palmyra. And uh, you see the headings of statues. The Taliban blowing up the Buddhas. Yeah, I got a story about that, David, because do you know that the Taliban actually is selling tickets and charging admission to see where the Buddhas used to be? Oh, that's funny. Uh, it's kind of funny. I thought you were about to say they're charging admission to watch people get beheaded and so on. So, yeah, I'd have to say I'd rather them charge admission to go see the lost, uh, the missing spaces of the Buddha. Yeah, there it is. That's There's one of the niches. And there's a guard there. This is a photo from a few years ago, so he's got the mask. Uh, but that's the niche where the giant Buddha statue was before the Taliban blew it up. And actually, there were Spanish tourists who were going, three Spanish tourists this past week were on their way to go see the empty space. I really don't understand the attraction here. But anyway, they were murdered uh, by unknown gunmen. But why, why do you think, do you think jihadis would have any interest in killing people who were going to see statues that weren't no longer there? No, maybe they just wanted to kill some kufar. Yeah, and also terrorize the populace 
the idea of tourism is jahiliya, really. It's the society of unbelievers, that even if they're just going to see the empty space, they are celebrating Afghanistan before Islam. But Afghanistan before Islam is jahiliya, worthless trash. And so it has to be, they, they have to be punished for that. Isn't the, uh, isn't the hypocrisy awesome? It's, ah, we destroyed your statue. Ah, we destroyed your ruins. Ah, we converted your church. Ah, we control the Temple Mount. Ha ha, we got all this stuff. Oh no, Hindus took down the Babri Masjid. Oh, entire world, will you sympathize with us? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, they know how to play the game. And the problem is there's so many people in the West who let them, who, who play along and say, oh yeah, oh, it's terrible, oh. And there's all this, uh, there, there was actually, where was it that Hindutva was condemned? Uh, was it in Seattle f a few few months ago? It's just incredible that uh, people take this seriously and they act like uh, Muslims are at some terrible disadvantage and being discriminated against in India when actually the jihadis are quite aggressive there. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar, it's a, I mean, it's a different situation from the situation in Israel, but it's similar in that you have one group that wants to completely exterminate the other group and conquer them and could and take over all their stuff. And if you resist these jihadis, you're the bad guys. You're the bad guys for not wanting to be wiped out. Yep. Of your own place, of, the, of your own place. So here's one from India. This is uh, Jivan Deep Singh. And you see he's uh, not in very good shape. He's been beat up pretty severely. And uh, Jivandeep Singh is a Sikh. And he was attacked by a Muslim mob in Chhattisgarh in India. And they said to him, I thought it was very interesting, David. Uh, let me get it here. They said to him... Um, Why, you are Hindu. Why have you come here? No Hindus are allowed. This is mini Pakistan. And they, they surrounded his car, beat his head against the steering wheel, broke the glass, attacked him with knives, iron rods, and belts because he was in what they said was a Muslim area. Mm. We've never heard that before, Muslim area. Yes. That is never what it's all one. about. You know, it's all about turf, isn't it? And the turf always has to grow of the House of Islam at the expense of the Dar al Harb, the House of War. So, uh, you know, it's the same in Israel, as you noted. It's the same in Europe today. And it's the same in India. Interesting story also out of India, David, from Gujarat. Uh, the Gujarat police, uh, they arrested a cleric, a Muslim cleric. They made the announcement, the National Investigation Agency, in the first week of May, we arrested a Malvi by the name of Suhail from the Surat district. And uh, he was apparently not very resolute or courageous, this Muslim cleric Suhail, because he ended up giving them the names of all of his accomplices. And they had this big plot to murder political leaders all over the country. But I thought, wait a minute, a Muslim cleric? Why... How could it be that somebody who's dedicated his life to understanding the religion of peace, how could he get involved in terrorism? That's never happened before, has it? No. I mean, it's always the people who misunderstand the religion who are the violent ones. And so those are the people who don't know anything. It's and incredible. Who, they, yeah, they just get, those are the people who just get their information about Islam from you. And they hear, oh, Islam calls for violence. And therefore, since Robert Spencer says it then we'll go out and be violent that's but it. yeah the idea that the idea that someone who actually studies islam would think that it's violent is just uh that's weird inconceivable meanwhile also in india we had a terrible story an honor killing a man named muhammad shahid killed his 18 year old daughter suhana in a muzar oh this is a great word muzafarnagar in Muzaffarnagar, Uttar Pradesh. What do you, how do you think he killed her, David? What do you, where, what do you think? Where, where was the fatal blow? 
Uh, I do not know this story. I'll go with Nick. You are correct, sir. Man, I'm going to owe you lots of money for all these right answers. But he Mm -hmm. said, no one played any role in the murder. Only I did it. I repeatedly tried to make her understand that she should not at least violate the family's honor. I have kept a beard and requested her to maintain its respect. But she went out and got a boyfriend. I told her that you will get married one day, Allah willing. However, she didn't listen to me and talked to her boyfriend regularly on the phone for three days. I asked her to tell me if she had any problems, but to no avail. And therefore, I killed her with a knife, which I took from home. That's good parenting right there. I asked her to tell me if she had any problems, but she refused, so I killed her. Yeah, and you listen to this guy. No one helped me do it. I did it myself. All the glory and honor are for me. I did it by myself. It's like a guy on a battlefield who, like, took out a whole platoon of Germans. He's going, I did it myself. I did it. It was me. And it's him killing his daughter. Wanting all all the honor. It reminds me of what you've said before about the the rape gangs. And that the rape gangs are uh, something that nobody's ashamed of within the purview of Islamic theology. And so you have uncles and cousins and relatives. Fathers and sons. Fathers and sons. Brothers, yeah. And so this guy, he's not ashamed of killing his own daughter. He's proud of it. So he wants to credit of that. He's proud of that. We're proud of that. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to see it in Britain too before too long. Already have, no doubt. All right, uh, let's see. Interesting story out of uh, Pakistan. In Pakistan, let's see, uh, Saima Bibi was working, serving tea to guests at her in place of employ when her employer, let's see, where is Saima? I know I have a picture of her. There she is, poor lady. Uh, she's quite seriously injured, as you can see. And uh, Saima Bibi was working. She was pouring tea for guests when her employer, Shah, Shahzad, nope, that's her father, I'm sorry. Uh, Muhammad Mustafa is her employer, drags her outside, pushes her toward an electric chaff cutter, tearing off her ear and cutting most of her scalp. And... This was something that they took to police. Police were indifferent, even though blood was gushing from her head. The father says he tried to file a case against Mohammed Mustafa with the Nishadabad police station in Faisalabad, but the officers refused to accept it. Why would they do that? Is that, the, is that the same area where uh, if the officers go against the Muslim mob, the Muslim mob uh, rips apart the police station and kills all them, too? Is that Very one of those likely. Places? Very likely. <laughs> and if it's any consolation, Robert, looks like a lot of places in Europe are about to be like that. I was where... just swinging back to Europe. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, we're familiar with, uh, you know, not too long ago where... You have these Pakistani rape gangs, and they can uh, groom, rape, gang rape, drug, pimp, uh, young British girls, and no one wants to lift a finger because they'll be called names, because they'll be called Islamophobes. So they're so scared. They were so scared of being called a name. They were so scared of being labeled an Islamophobe or a racist that they would gladly let little girls be raped and have their lives completely ruined forever um, just for, you know, j- the little girls are being sacrificed on the altar of, uh, of this kind of tolerance. But, but in the future, in the future, it won't be, oh, we don't, we, we just have to look the other way because if we say something, we're going to be called Islamophobe. It's going to be, uh, this is what's going on and we have to look the other way or a mob's going to show up and kill us all. Yep. That's so the next we- step. We, we totally have to keep our mouths shut as little girls are being raped. We are completely powerless against the mob here. So dark days ahead. Glad we're in the U.S. Indeed. Better so than that, than us. That's Saima Bibi. 
in Pakistan. And so that's the fate of a young non-Muslim girl, Christian girl in Pakistan. She uh, can't get justice. She's horribly disfigured and abused, and the police are indifferent. Meanwhile, parallel, sort of an opposite kind of case out of Austria. And in Austria, in Graz... Österreich. Österreich. Österreich, ja. In Graz, in uh, Jakominiplatz Square, uh, a 14-year-old girl, Muslim girl, was planning to get a knife and a hatchet. And uh, she said that what she wanted to do was go out into Jakominiplatz and kill as many infidels as possible. So on the one hand, you've got in Pakistan, you've got this uh, poor girl who is brutalized by her employer and can't get anything, any, any redress of any kind. And then in Austria, you've got a 14-year-old Muslim girl living in relative comfort and ease, and nobody's bothering her at all, and she plots mass murder of infidels. I mean, all this, I mean, everything's connected. You've got, uh, you've got the Dawa guys going around encouraging young people to seek martyrdom and stuff. And so and it's, it's, it's global, but it's parallel to the situation with like Hamas and the Hamas leaders. The Hamas leaders are billionaires uh, living in other countries while their children, while, while their kids drive Lamborghinis around and so on. But it's similar with the Dawa guys. The Dawa guys are going around encouraging young people to seek martyrdom, saying that that the, the Islamic concept of the suicide attacks and so on gives them an advantage because they're willing to go further than other people who try to preserve life and so on. They're going around saying this while they're you know living large and having uh, multiple wives and uh, piles and endless piles of donations and so on. But it's the uh, it's the young people who are actually doing this stuff whose lives are being ruined. And Robert, I mean, you've seen, so that's a 14 year old girl. We saw the uh, the 16 year old in France, the multiple 16 year olds and multiple teenagers in Australia. It was a 16 year old who attacked Bishop Marmari, Emmanuel and so on. And so the young people are sitting there watching the videos of the Dawa guys and going out and trying to kill people. And uh, meanwhile, the Dawa guys are free to, free to proclaim their message on YouTube. They're posting this stuff on YouTube. Yep. Wild stuff, wild and I And I got the restrictions and being demonetized and all that, and they don't have any of that. Nope, none of that. Nope. All right, did you hear about this one? Quantico Marine Base in Virginia? Nope. Nope. Quantico Marine Base in Virginia. This guy from Jordan drives up. He, 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 uh, he just recently crossed the border from Mexico, which, of course, anybody can just walk over now. And he is a Jordanian national on the terror watch list. He gets a delivery truck and he drives to Quantico Marine Base in Virginia. And at the gates of Quantico, he said, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm here to deliver. Uh, uh, I've got uh, de Amazon deliveries. Uh, uh, my truck, uh, my company was subcontracted by Amazon to make deliveries at Quantico. And yet he uh, cannot produce any of the uh, ordinary permissions and credentials and so on that they uh, usually produce when they're going on to these heavily secure areas. And so he was asked to uh, go to a holding area for vetting. And instead of driving his truck into the holding area for vetting, he just tried to drive on into the base whereupon they activated their vehicle uh, denial barriers and stopped him. But uh, you got to wonder, David, this very zealous Amazon driver, alleged Amazon driver, is so intent on getting his packages delivered. It's, it's kind of heartening, really, if you order from these places. Uh, he's just going to defy the security and get on. But anyway, he is a Jordanian national on the terror watch list. You just said a minute ago, it's a good thing we're in America, but how long is that going to last? Yeah, and if you think, uh, what's this guy trying to do? Uh, he could be, of course, trying to scope out the place for uh, plotting something else, or it could have just been, hey, if I get on here with a uh, with a vehicle, I can slam that vehicle into some people. 
uh, on the base. And it's just, uh, it's just the bright side is that, you know, he could have gone after kindergartners or something like that. And he instead chose to try to get onto a military base and didn't work. It does seem to have been a dry run of some kind because at least reportedly there wasn't anything found in the truck. Uh, so maybe he was just testing the security and how easy it was to get onto the base and then something else would follow. Uh, these guys are always working. Um, and a lot of times people do not recognize that that is indeed the case. Uh, another situation where I think people don't really realize what is exactly going on is the case of Muhammad Amin. This is Muhammad Amin, and Muhammad Amin is in Britain. Uh, he was just sentenced to two years and ten months in prison because he was found guilty of exposing himself to Jewish women and girls in a heavily Jewish area of London. The victims were all Jewish. He wasn't interested, apparently, in exposing himself to any random woman, but to only to Jewish women. And uh, some of them were as young as 12 years old. Uh, now, why do you think no. he would do such so, a thing? So he's interested in older women compared to Muhammad, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, he had also previously been found guilty of sexual assault on a child, although that child was thirteen, between 13 and 15. So, uh, what, what, why do you think he would target Jewish women for something like this? Why, why them? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, they love Jews. Well, I think that, uh, personally, I think that it has to do with humiliation, that it's, uh, it's the idea is like rape, the rape gangs, part of the idea comes from the captives of the right hand and all the business about how you can use non-muslim women who are the spoils of war sexually but also the idea is to assert the superiority of islam yet again and humiliate the women of the infidels and so it's particularly the jews in this case because of course right now we have this war going on as someone who's been to prison, you know, you get locked up and people, hey, what are you in here for? Oh, I robbed a store. What are you in here for? Uh, I shot someone. What are you in here for? I showed a Jewish girl my pee-pee. <laughs> now, yes. <clears throat> in the U see, here's the thing. In the U.S., that guy would get the crap beat out of him just for, for flashing at, at a girl just for flashing himself with a girl. He'd get the crap beat out of him. Over there, I'll be here. Whoa, oh, wow, what a, what a beautiful new form of jihad. We show these Jewish girls our peepees. You see, Allah will be so proud. You're a true martyr. Ooh. Be a hero in prison over in the UK. Yes, that's correct, sir. A uh, story out of Egypt, somewhat tangentially related. This is, <coughs> this is Martina Mamdu Wadi who is a Christian girl in uh, Egypt, and she disappeared. She disappeared from uh, the uh, Cairo University when she was uh, supposed to be appearing at, yeah, at, she was supposed to be going to an exam at Cairo University, but I'm sorry, on her way home after the exam, she didn't show up. After a while, her uh, father received in the mail a certificate of her conversion to Islam. And it turned out that a Muslim had abducted her and had taken her away to convert her to Islam and marry her. We see stories like this out of Pakistan in particular, all the time. And what is the idea behind that? I should say before we get into that, Martina Mamdu Wadi was actually rescued. And so uh, as far as I know, she is safe at this time. But uh, that's unusual for mm -hmm. these kinds of situations. What's the idea here? Well, in Islam, you can, you can take captives and so on and uh, marry them and 
Of course, there there are forced conversions in Islam, and so this. Uh, I only I only found. I mean, I knew this goes. This of course goes way back, but I only found out its connection to uh, to the tattoos um, <clears throat> when me and AP were in Israel, and the guy there. So it's a it's a Coptic it's a Coptic tattoo place in the old uh, in the uh, the old city of Jerusalem, and they've been doing tattoos for like eight hundred years. Uh, the family, this one family. And uh, so anyway, they were pointing out that people people bring in their like one and two year olds and stuff like that to get tattoos. And we we're confused by that. Like, what the heck? What you tattoo? You tattoo babies and toddlers and stuff like that. And I mentioned it online. And then some other uh, some Coptic Christians said, no, this goes way back, uh, back in the day. In places like Egypt, a Muslim would just kidnap your kid and say, "What are you talking about? This is this is uh, this is our kid, or this is our daughter, or this is our wife, and things like that." And then what what could you do about it? So they started just tricking out their kids with crosses and Coptic tattoos, so that if there's ever a situation where you say, "No, that's my kid, that's not your kid," well, why is your Muslim kid decked out in cross tattoos? Could you please explain that? So it just became the it became the tattoos all over became a way of protecting your kids from people who think, hey, these people are inferior. If I want to go take one of their kids to uh, raise as my wife, then I can do that. Also, I believe that the, for the most part, anyway, I could be wrong about this, but uh, I think the Coptic tattoos, at there, there may be more than one, but there's one in particular place on the hand because then they always know if it's been covered, if it's been powdered over or attempted to be removed in some way they know right where to look to try to discern if there had been a tattoo there or if there was one concealed there and it's all the same idea i got i got one more story here we got to hit uh before time is up this is out of domino's pizza in malaysia and i didn't even know there was domino's pizza in malaysia is it is that the one where someone said something about stupid Islam and everyone freaked That's out it. or something? I got oh, the yeah, I heard about that. Right I heard about that. He's got yeah. the receipts. He brought the receipts, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. He he makes an online order, and I don't know. Maybe the guy was drunk or something, but uh, apparently the call to prayer was going on while he's making the online order, and so he writes on his online order at this noisy place with stupid moaning sound like have sex every day <laughs> stupid islam <laughs> <laughs> and he's ordering his pizza so uh the actually the domino's pizza in malaysia went into full damage control mode they lodged a police report and they issued a statement mm. we are deeply disappointed a customer made a hurtful and disrespectful comment while placing their order. We are also disappointed one of our team members thought it was appropriate to share this online, including the customer's personal information, which might have been a death threat right there. Uh, but uh, why would Domino's so readily fold and say, you know, instead of just saying, oh, come on, get over it, it's a, it's a receipt, that why are they calling the police? What is the big deal? Well, you gotta you gotta show that you're outraged, or uh, people burn your place to the ground. There you go. It's all about fear. Islam is an empire of fear from beginning to end. I, hey, I, yeah. Oh, I have to say, I do like souvenirs from uh, from fun things like this. I don't I don't really collect anything in life, but uh, to uh, to that Domino's pizza and that receipt. I'll buy that receipt. <laughs> I'll buy that receipt. Hey, hey, Domino's, whoever has that receipt, 500 bucks cash. Send that to me. 500 bucks Probably, cash. I'm going uh, to frame it. My guess would be the Malaysian police have it. But... Yeah, Malaysian police. Malaysian police. Pull that thing out of the folder. Contact me. Contact me. Say we have it. Here's a picture of it. We've got it. Send it to me. 500 bucks cash that's gonna go a long way in malaysia that'll be buy a you buy your you buy brand new dominoes buy that's brand it. new dominoes restaurant in malaysia <laughs> yep all right well um i think that's about all we've got time for i was going to go into how uh 
all of Islamic morality is based on fear. It's worth noting here at the end that the a big critique of Islam against the West is that uh, Islam is moral and the West is is depraved. And there's no doubt the West is pretty getting is crazy and getting crazier. But it, it, Islam's not really virtuous. It's just everybody's no. too afraid to get out of line because they'll get stoned or uh, get their hands cut off or who knows what, beheaded, thrown from the top of a building, et cetera, et cetera. That's not really virtue, ladies and gentlemen. No, and that's a huge problem because if, if, all of, if the way you act is all based on fear of outside consequences, then what happens if you remove those consequences? You get people who have no functioning moral compass. And so you take people from Pakistan where they have certain fears of certain punishments for certain things they might do, and you say, oh, let's take a bunch of these people over to the UK where they can rape little girls with impunity and no one's going to stop them. And whoa, and why, why are they all doing this? Yep. They, 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 had, they had no internal virtue. They had, they had never had a reason to develop virtue at all. And then you, oh, let's, let, let's let them, uh, let's, let, let's unleash them on our daughters. And that's smart. what's happening. Smart. Very smart. Still nobody gets it. But we, we are going to still keep bringing it, and so we will... Oh, no, I'm on the road again next week, but we'll be back sometime. There's unli unlikely to be no more jihad, so mm -hmm, we'll be back mm -hmm. as soon as we can, and until then, you know the story. Pray hope, and don't worry. <laughs>